today we are talking about the Rudi, Ludi Romani, the Roman games. And uh, we're going to look at a bunch of art. This one here uh, is from Basso Massimo, which the American Institute for Roman Culture has filmed. It's one of four museums that are part of the Museo Nazionale Romano. This particular piece dates to late antiquity from the uh, property of Junius Bassus on the Esquiline Hill. And it does figure a scene from uh, the Circus Maximus. So what is the Ludi Romani all about? Well, it is ostensibly to honor Jupiter Optimus Maximus, the king of the gods on the Capitoline Hill. We're not exactly sure who starts it, who creates it. Was it the Tarquin? So we're going into the end of the regal period or as more sources like Cicero and Dionysus of Halicarnassus say in, in the late uh, Republican slash Augustan period, it was for the victory that the Romans won against the Latins in 496 BC. Now, when does it take place? That's another great question for the historians. As we look at the sources, it's not September 4th to the 19th from the get-go. It's just one day. But when something is successful, when something works, well, continue in that vein. So over time, through greater wealth, through continued success, you add more days to that festival. And not just this Ludo Romani festival, but other festivals in the Roman calendar are going to be having days added to them over time. And the last day is going to be added after the death of Julius Caesar. And that's because his statue is added in the procession. He is now a god upon his death. And so his statue will join the procession of the gods. And we'll talk about which gods are being shown around in this uh, performance, in this celebration, ostensibly in honor of Jupiter Optimus Maximus. But it's, it's a typical thing when we look at the Roman calendar, there's an idea, it's inserted into the calendar, and then over time, you simply add to that celebration because you have greater funds, you have more victories to celebrate, you have more cash on hand, and of course, you have a way of appeasing and winning over the crowd initially for uh, elections and so forth. Um, so it's not actually annual, we think, until the fourth century. And at that point, you have specific edials that are going to be uh, selected to run those particular games. So again, it's all about Jupiter Optimus Maximus. Here's his temple on the left from one of the panels of a relief, a series of reliefs that are attributed to a uh, victory arch of Marcus Aurelius. Here he is making a sacrifice, and in the, in the background, it is in fact the pediment, the best preserved pediment representation we have of the Temple of Jupiter Optimus Maximus. There's a coin from about 78 BC depicting the Temple of Jupiter Optimus Maximus. Again, we're spending a lot of time talking about this because we also want to enter into the physical spaces of ancient Rome. So here we are on the right looking at a map of the Capitoline Hill and what figures prominently is Tempio di Giove Capitolino, the Temple of Jupiter Optimus Maximus or Jupiter that lives on the Capitoline Hill. And that is where the procession will start that will eventually culminate in the Circus Maximus and then that is where the bulk of the activities honoring Jupiter will be held. Uh, you also see uh, just off the area of the Temple of Giove uh, Capitolino, uh, you actually have the Clevis Capitolinus, which is the road that leads you down into the Forum. And we will walk through this procession route uh, just shortly. But who are our sources? We have a number of ancient sources. I mentioned Cicero earlier. I mentioned Dionysius of Halicarnassus. He's writing in the Augustan age, but he actually cites, quotes, a particular earlier source we don't really have anymore, and that is Quintus Fabius Pictor, who's writing there at the third century BC. So here, 200 BC, the third century BC, a very ancient and prominent source that Dionysius of Halicarnassus dips into. He is writing in Greek. Quintus Fabius Pictor, a Roman, also wrote in Greek. He was a great early historian for us and a great source for Dionysius of Halicarnassus. And he is the great source, really, of what we are talking about uh, in the ensuing uh, slides. That is, what took place and the, in, in terms of the games honoring Jupiter Optimus Maximus and the procession. 
Because before you start any event in the Colosseum, so the amphitheaters, in the circus, there is a procession. And it's all you could say modeled after or referring to uh, a number of Greek processions, but also the triumphal procession of the victorious general snaking his way with his procession, his goods, his spoils of war through the city of Rome. But here are our ancient sources, an Augustan source and a much earlier Republican source. Okay, so these are the places that we will cover. So you start off on the Capitoline Hill and you're gonna make your way into the forum and you're gonna make your way over to the Circus Maximus. Now, who's actually in the procession? We'll talk about that later. Right now, I just wanna talk about the actual processional route that by the imperial period can be modified and change. It will evolve over time. The triumphal procession evolves over time. The pompa, the procession of the uh, Ludi Romani will also evolve and change over time and, and basically expand into the campus marshes. But you can see here we have a lot of videos that are already at your disposal. The Capitoline Hill, the Clevis Capitolinus, the Roman Forum, we have several. The Temple of the Castors is one of the individual monuments that we filmed inside the Roman Forum. The Vicus Tuscus is the road that connects you from the Forum to the Circus Maximus, skirting along the base of the Palatine Hill, and finally culminating in the Circus Maximus where we have uh, another video. So we start at the Capitoline Hill. There's the large Temple of Jupiter Optimus Maximus in the Imperial period. We leave the sanctuary of the Temple of Jupiter Optimus Maximus. Of course, there are many other temples around here. And go down the slope of the Capitoline Hill on this road, the Clevis Capitolinus. As you go down, you see to your right the impressive, still impressive remains of the Temple of Saturn. Here it is again. You're going to make your way through that road that we see there in the distance. Uh, that's then, in other words, you're going down the Clevis Capitolinus, around the Temple of Saturn, and then down straight the road. To your left is the Piazza of the Forum. To the right, the remains of the Basilica Julia, about the size of a football field. And when you get to those three columns of the Temple of the Castors, you hang a right. There is where the Vicus Tuscus starts. And the Vicus Tuscus gets his name from the Etruscans that lived in that area, like an Etruscan quarter. And here we have again a plan of the Roman form itself. You can see at the bottom of the plan all the colonnades of the massive Basilica Julia, and then you have the temple, which is represented on the right by a Piranesi a print, and then you're going to turn them right in that space between the Basilica Julia and the Temple of the Castors, and you're going to start your Vicus Tuscus procession. So we're going to talk about who's in the procession shortly, but just imagine already a lot of people, a lot of animals, a lot of guys on horseback are going to be going through, relatively speaking, tight spaces. But how impressive it would have been to see that procession going from the Capitoline Hill down the Clevis Capitolinus and through the Roman Forum, then on the Vicus Tuscus. Here you see three arrows that are connecting you uh, along the route of the Vicus Tuscus. And at the bottom right of the screen, it says Circus Maximus. So you finally get your way into the Circus Maximus. You can see to the left of the screen, the Capitoline Hill, the Capitolium. You make your way into the Forum and then down the Vicus Tuscus into the Circus Maximus. Here is the Circus Maximus today as it stands with a medieval tower in it. And on the right, one of the impressive coins of the time of Trajan, who really does build and give us the uh, Circus Maximus built to its greatest and most magnificent state. And that's just some of the brick remains that you see in the photo on the left of the Circus Maximus of today, which you can visit as a site. It's very impressive to go to that archeological site of the Comune of Rome. And we have actually a video also of the archeological site visit of the Circus Maximus on ancientromelive.org. Okay, it's the events that take place uh, principally in the Circus Maximus are chariot races with chariots pulled by two horses, three horses and four horses. The Lucis Troiae is something that doesn't always happen, but by the time of Augustus, it becomes pretty standardized, hearkening back to that idea that the Romans are descended from Aeneas, who escapes the destruction of Troy. There are boxing matches, there are dancing competitions, and there are even theatrical performances by the fourth century BC. Of course, those dramatical performances will be held in other places where the venues are of theaters. Finally, by the time of Pompey the Great, then Augustus, those theaters are becoming permanent, also the theater of Balbus. 
but we do want to think that it's more than just one venue, although this is, in the Circus Maximus, the main venue for the procession and the experiences. Now, look at some of the uh, images of charioteers. We can go immediately to Plaza Massimo, which is part of Museo Nazionale Romano, where we have filmed a fantastic video. And these uh, charioteers, uh, here's one of them, dressed in blue, so the blue team comes from a private villa, Villa di Beccano in Rome. Here's another famous fragment relief of chariot racing. You can just get a sense of the, the violence and the drama and the movement. Uh, and this is also from Plaza Massimo, part of Museo Nazionale Romano. Now, what is the procession actually all about? This pompa circensis. You've got Roman youth. So you kind of start off with the creme de la creme, the youth, the people that are just about to become men on horseback if they can afford it, otherwise on foot, so they'll be infantrymen. And that is just part of a lavish procession to say, here are our young men that are eventually going to be fighting for you and eventually uh, write the connection with Jupiter Optimus Maximus who uh, leads and protects the Roman state. Then charioteers that will be performing, the athletes that will be competing, the dance groups that will be uh, performing and competing, musician groups. The chorus is about people that dress up like satyrs and silene and they are going to be uh, lampooning a lot of the dancer musician groups. So some fun there. And of course, when you think of satyrs and Selene, maybe you think of Dionysus, maybe you think about Greek traditions. And of course, yes, what the Romans eventually have, what we see, what we have described by Dionysus and Halicarnassus are indeed indebted to a lot of Greek traditions and processions. There'll be bowls of perfume. They're gonna be burning incense, a lot of pageantry. Of course, you are honoring Jupiter Optimus Maximus. You are also honoring lots of other gods. Gods are carried on litters called fircula and displayed on couches, the pulvinar, in the circus itself. Who are the gods? Three main groups. The standard pantheon led by Jupiter. The older gods, kind of the precursors to the 12 gods like Saturn, Ops, Themis, Latona, the Parcae, Minosine, okay? And then find the gods of the underworld. Persephone, Lucina, the nymphs, muses, seasons, the graces, Liber, demigods, okay, a lot of people are involved here. It gets to be quite crowded. Then you have separate chariots or wagons that will also pull the exuviae, which are basically the attributes themselves of those deities. So a thunderbolt or a mural crown or a lion or right, some sort of attribute that is uh, sacred as well as the actual cult statues that go first. So the procession is massive. You can think about the numbers, you can think about the, 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 the long train of people, individuals, uh, and finally, of course, the gods themselves are participating. What does a fair color look like? I'll give you this one example. This one comes from Praeneste, the sanctuary of Fortuna Primogenia, which is also tied to the cult of Fortuna of Ancium uh, on the coast, and so you have two cult statues, two different variation representations of the Fortunae of those two cities, which you can see here. The knobs at the bottom of the, below their torsos would be, or is a representation in marble of the kind of poles that would have been attached to the cult statues and then lifted up by men and then placed here on, in this case here, a marble stone couch. So we have a great example of a fricula with actual representations of the gods themselves, two deities from um, Antium and uh, Praeneste, both in Lazio. So that's really what I wanted to say about this incredible moment in time, in uh, antiquity. And of course, what we have here is uh, a perpetuation of that kind of idea when we look at society beyond the Romans, we look around the world, we look at the way in which we have um, pageantry, a build up to the start of a, of a sports season. We have the procession of the, uh, of the uh, performers uh, before the start of the match, kind of getting everyone worked up. And of course, the culmination with, with uh, most people then most of the activities will be focused on the Circus Maximus. Of course, it's also the greatest, the largest venue of the entire city. That's why it's the best place to look at the uh, triumphal procession as well. 
Uh, and there are many other games. There are plebeian games. There are many other games that take place throughout the course of the year. The games of Sola, the games of Caesar. But this one here in particular is the greatest because it is the Ludi of the Romans. And who is a featured star who is being venerated, who is being uh, lavished uh, with attention is Jupiter Optimus Maximus, of course, king of the gods. So you want the other gods there present as well. So this has been Ancient Rome Live. You can subscribe to Ancient Rome Live by going to ancientromelive.org. Subscribe to our YouTube channel, We Dig Rome. Very easy to, uh, to follow all of our activities. Of course, you can follow us on social media, at Save Rome and at Darius Aria Digs on Instagram, on Twitter, and Facebook. And uh, we're going to have a great fall. We thank you for joining me. And uh, we'll see you again soon. Please uh, subscribe so that you can be aware of all the upcoming activities in the coming fall season. Thanks a lot.